Okay, so today in the myth class, we are going to focus on trickster heroes. We're going to do a little bit of an introduction to creation myths, but the trickster is going to be kind of our precursor to the heroes. As we're going to be studying hero myths throughout the semester, I thought it was a good place to start with the trickster hero or just the trickster figure as is commonly known. Um, it's kind of an interesting figure and I'm going to hopefully point out to you as we go through this lecture why the trickster is a precursor to the hero, where they have parallels, also where they have divergences because the trickster is also a precursor to the villain in a certain way. So we're going to look at a number of things and talk also about how the trickster archetype is still with us in modern culture. Okay, so let's dive in and take a look at this idea of trickster heroes. So this is the, officially the introduction to creation myths and trickster heroes. And in a previous semester, if I wasn't focusing just on hero myths, I would spend a whole section in the beginning of the course dealing with creation myths. So I don't want to go through all of the issues that arise in creation myths, like the big cosmological questions and the way different cultures handle you know, the creation of the universe and the early gods. But I am going to have to touch on some of the things as we get into you know, directly the trickster heroes, which is going to be the focus of the presentation. So let's start by looking at a couple of the archetypes that we're going to deal with. And I think I mentioned in the course of this semester, we're going to be looking at archetypes at a number of different points. I basically defined archetype in the intro lecture last time. And as we go through, I'm going to unpack these archetypes today. But the archetypes that you guys are going to see in the presentation, of course, the trickster, <clears throat> sometimes referred to as the jester, the fool, um, manifest in a few different ways. The father and the mother figures, uh, which are very important, especially in creation myths, as we're going to see. And I'm going to probably talk more about the father figure. Often um, the king could be another representation of the father archetype. But I'm going to deal with those a little bit later. The mother archetype we're probably going to handle more in a different lecture as it becomes important. But I will mention it um, you know, on the side today. So let's talk about hero myths before we get into the trickster in general. Now we're going to have an entire lecture just on hero myths. It's actually one of the longer lectures of the semester. But to get things started, I want you to understand that the focus of hero mythology and the focus of the hero narrative is going to be on transformation or initiation, right? Initiation meaning the beginning of something. And when we think about initiation rites and rituals in human religion and culture, we're talking about rites that mark out a transition between one stage of a person's life and another stage. So the whole idea of initiation and transformation are intimately entwined, okay? And the hero stories are about that. It's about the dynamic character that is going to hopefully evolve in the proper way in the course of his adventures. Other themes that are mixed in, which actually go hand in hand with this idea of transformation, are the themes of struggle. Because it's through struggle that we actually begin the transformation. Transformation is never an easy process, right? There's pain involved in growth, right? You guys have all grown, you know, you've heard the idea of, uh, of growing pains. Literally, you know, physical pain in your body as you're going through these growth spurts when you're younger. But there's also a type of growth pain that we go through as we mature, you know, intellectually, uh, psychologically, not just physically. So you've got this idea of nature versus culture that's going to manifest over and over again in these stories, as well as in creation stories. The wild versus the, the civilized, that's one of the themes I really want to focus on when we get to some of the really big heroes. So we're going to look at that theme, you know, big time when we get to Gilgamesh, when we get to Heracles, when we get to Achilles and various other places throughout the semester. So um, that will become more understandable as we do that. And also this idea of chaos versus order. These are all related, right? On the, on the one side, nature, the wild, chaos. On the other side, culture, which is civilized and orderly, right? There's this duality. Lots of mythology deals with contrasts and contradictions and mediation between these extremes, okay? So these stories are no different. Now, the hero stories are also paralleled, interestingly, in creation stories, which is why I want to do a little bit of an introduction to what creation stories are about. So in a general way, we could say creation stories are almost always dealing with the development of culture out of nature, or better, the 
beginning of order out of disorder, right? Moving from cosmos, I'm sorry, got that backwards. Moving from chaos, which is this disorderly beginning, to a state of cosmos, which is an ordered universe. So we're going to be talking about the Enuma Elish early on in the semester. In the Enuma Elish, you're going to meet Marduk, who is the god and creator figure who takes on the dragon of chaos of Tiamat. All right. Um, it's a creation story, but the combat between the two is characterized like kind of a hero versus dragon. All right. This is a very common motif in hero stories, the dragon slayer. All right, Marduk is one of the earliest dragon slayers that we have in world literature. So we're going to look at that. So it's both in the form of a hero story, but it's also a creation myth. Um, we are probably not going to look at the story of Zeus versus his father Kronos. It's a battle between the generations, which is very common to hero stories. But Zeus, again, is going to be the one who overthrows Kronos and sets up a new order. Okay, Horus and Osiris versus Set we will take a look at when we do the Egyptian mythology. That's going to be... You know, pretty close when we deal with the Enuma Elish. Again, you've got chaos versus order. You know, Horus and Osiris representing order, Set representing chaos. Uh, we will not do the creation story of the Norse, but we will be dealing with Norse mythology, particularly in um, both the story of the death of Baldur, which will be coming up, and later in the Volsunga saga. So we'll see Odin at a number of places. But, you know, Odin is the creator and his myth where he destroys the great uh, frost giant of Ymir, okay? And then from the corpse, this is the same with Marduk and Tiamat, from the corpse of the slain um, force of nature, whether it's the dragon or the frost giant, the god is then going to shape and create the world, okay? So literally taking chaos, ripping it apart and organizing it into an orderly universe. Same thing happens in Aztec myth when you get to Tezcatlipoca, who happens to actually be kind of a trickster character. Um, in the creation story, you've got Tezcatlipoca along with the god Quetzalcoatl, who do battle with the monstrous goddess in the water, and they tear apart her and then fashion the earth from her corpse. So over and over again, you've got this contest, chaos versus order, and then a world emerges from that. Um, every once in a while, I'll, I'll forget probably to point out some of the visuals that you guys see on the screen, but... Um, here basically is, a, is a, a figure representing Zeus on the left and um, a much later painting um, of Kronos devouring his children. If you don't know the story of Zeus and Kronos, Kronos, who is trying to avoid being overthrown, right? There's always a prophecy in these stories about the potential overthrow by a child. And every time that he has a child or his wife gives birth to a child, he goes into this stage of absolute um, insanity and blindness and he devours his children the story is whole. Um, some of the graphic depictions later on show him actually ripping them apart and eating them. But uh, it's kind of a happy ending in that they don't die. They actually emerge later as he vomits them up. Uh, Zeus being the one child that he does not swallow, which is why he's the one who initiates the rebellion and overthrow of his dad. <clears throat> How many of you guys are familiar with the story of Zeus and the Titans or the gods and Titans, Zeus and Kronos? Anybody? Okay. Good, good. Yeah, that's, that's uh, pretty familiar story. All right, let's take a look at this uh, chaos versus cosmos. Let me unpack it just a little bit further. If you're looking at the, the screen, I probably should have animated it so you could know exactly which box you're supposed to read first, but you could follow that line around. So chaos, like I said, is this orderlessness. Um, it's an undifferentiated, formless, in incomprehensible state of things. And when I say incomprehensible, that simply means you can't wrap your mind around chaos. That's the whole idea of chaos. It's beyond comprehension, right? Um, whereas cosmos, right, is the formed and comprehensible. It's the ordered world. And like I said, creation myths are about order coming out of disorder. Now, if you think about how we know things, how we learn things, how we grow uh, as we go through life, right? You go to the fourth box there, you know, it says personal chaos. We've all got a particular worldview. I know we've talked about this before, and we're going to talk about this a lot throughout the semester. So you have a particular way that you approach the world. You have pr uh, particular presuppositions and understandings that you bring to everyday experience. Um, as things happen, as you experience new phenomena, as you're presented with new pieces of information, what we try to do is plug them into our worldview so that we can make sense of the world, that we can understand the world. 
Now, the problem is every once in a while, we're going to come across a piece of data or an experience that kind of throws chaos into our own worldview. It throw our, throws our lives off balance. Um, there are things that don't seem to make sense to us. We can't wrap our minds around it, all right? And it's a painful thing that causes us to grow and struggle. I mean, any, any, anytime you've taken a course in college where you're presented with some really challenging information, uh, it could be as simple as a math class if you're not like really geared towards um, thinking mathematically. You might have, you know, struggle with math. So the process of learning the material is going to be much more of a struggle than somebody that, you know, is uh, kind of geared already towards that kind of thinking. It's going to be very easy for them. Okay. But, you know, through the pain and struggle, you can get a hold of the concepts. Um, philosophy is always a great example. Um, no, I, I went through, you know, my own training in philosophy, as I told you guys, I think in the beginning of the semester, you know, one of my degrees is in philosophy. And, you know, very often in the early stages of studying philosophy, you get very, very frustrated. I spent a lot of times in class listening to lectures and um, trying to follow a conversation that was just definitely going over my head. And very often I was tempted to just throw in the towel, right? Give it up, forget about it. This is going to be too difficult. And it got emotional at times when I thought, you know, maybe I'm majoring in the wrong thing altogether. And, you know, maybe I really don't have any place doing it. But um, one of the lessons that we'll see later on in the semester is, you know, a lesson that we get in mythology of perseverance. And sometimes as we stick with something long enough, we start to be able to force some order on that material. And it starts to take shape in a certain sense. And we start to understand it. And then it starts to fit together. And one of the good things about growing through that process is we all have worldviews that have problems, right? Our worldview doesn't necessarily always line up with reality. So when we're presented with pieces that don't fit, we either will judge those pieces of information as just false and kind of dismiss them. Or if we can't do that, it's going to force us to maybe modify our worldview. Right, come to a different approach to reality, and that's the process where you grow and emerge more mature. Right, so that's the idea here. And if you think about the idea of organizing and ordering things as necessary for knowledge, um, think back to maybe something like a biology class. If you took biology, you know, in high school or in middle school, you learn about the classification of um, biological organisms, right? into kingdoms and phyla, class order, genus, family, species, all that kind of stuff. And that's really about taking different things and classifying them so that we can understand relationships. We kind of structure knowledge in that way. Now, according to certain schools of philosophy, particularly the Aristotelian tradition, which um, I'm going to bring in over and over again throughout the semester, the view of the intellect is that it has a natural end, meaning a natural goal or a natural tendency which it's um, seeking. Uh, and that end of the intellect is to know and understand things. I mean, that's what the intellect is for, for, for grasping things. Um, so chaos is fundamentally beyond understanding, as we said. So the, the whole idea of chaos um, causes at least an intellectual pain, an intellectual growth process. So if I wanted to throw more Aristotelian terminology into there to unpack it just slightly further, we could talk about this idea of matter and form. This is something that we're going to talk about probably later this semester because it's useful for certain things. But if you take my uh, ancient and med medieval humanities class or my you know, humanities one course, I will spend time on the ancient Greek philosophers and we'll spend time with Aristotle. But for now, let me just give you a very simple understanding of what we mean by matter and form. Matter... As Aristotle puts it forth, is kind of this potential. Um, it's a potential to be formed, a potential to receive form. And form is more of the determinant aspect of a thing. Once it's attached to matter, will produce a substance or a thing, right? So form determines the thing's nature, all right? So if you move again according to the boxes where it says prime matter, if you think of prime matter as just being raw indeterminate matter, it's really nothing in particular. But when you unite it with a form, it produces a thing, something that we'll call a substance. And it's only the substance or thing that you can understand. And to give an analogy that I think is useful, think of a lump of clay. How many of you have taken an art class as a little kid where you're playing with clay? Or even if it's not an art class, maybe you had Play-Doh, right, growing up. Play-Doh reminds me of Play-Doh, so it fits with philosophy really well. Anyways, 
Plato um, is just indeterminate. It's just, you know, this basically represents matter in its raw form or chaos. And what we do is we then take it, we start to roll it, we start to press it, we start to put it into some kind of form. And now I've got something that I could talk about, right? I maybe made a little uh, dog or I maybe made a little model of a tree out of the clay. Or if it's clay, you know, you can make it into a vase. When I was in kindergarten, believe it or not, um, in school, we got to make ashtrays. I don't think they ever do that in school today with kids, but um, back then we did. So once I've made it, you know, that formless clay into something by imposing a form on it, then I've got a thing that I can talk about. And that's the way we know the world. We understand things because they have form. In one way, the Aristotelian, or rather the scholastic tradition of philosophy, has understood knowledge is by describing knowledge as the taking in of a new form, right? At least cognitionally, you're actually taking the form into yourself. You're becoming something new as you take those concepts away from particular objects. And it gets a little bit more abstract, and I know I'm probably going off in a direction that I don't need to, but I want you to understand this in light of, again, cosmos, out of chaos, um, imposing form on the formless, order on the orderless, and how this actually applies to our personal growth and development. So that's kind of the picture I'm hopefully getting across. Does that make sense to you guys? I'll take a sip of my coffee if you guys just give me you know, a thumbs up or a thumbs down. If you have a question, feel free to top, uh, you know, type it out, but I see agreement, so we're probably good to go on. All right. Let's move on to the tricksters. Finally, <laughs> trickster heroes. The trickster, like I said, is a precursor to the hero proper. Now, why is this the case? The trickster we could also call the fool. And if we think about hero stories as being about initiation and transformation, the fool is the one who begins something that's brand new because it actually takes somewhat of a fool to go ahead and go down a path that is dark. You don't know where it's going to lead. I mean, the whole idea of it being new is nobody's been there before. We don't have any knowledge of what lies down that road. So it doesn't just require foolishness. It also requires bravery, right? The willingness to be a fool. And of course, bravery is a response to fear. We'll talk a lot about fear um, in a couple of weeks, right? So fear would be maybe an unwillingness to go down this road. And of course, if you're too afraid, if you don't have the characteristic of bravery to overcome that fear, then there's not going to be any transformation. There's not going to be any development. Okay? It's like this idea, well, I'll unpack that later. I think there's another slide that talks about that. So that's why the trickster is an important figure in the whole transformation process. Now, the primary characteristic of the trickster archetype is going to be the intellect. Just talked about the intellect a second ago. Now, the intellect in the trickster character can have positive or negative connotations. That's one of the things you're going to notice about all the different archetypes. There are very often not only um, groupings of opposite archetypes and this duality that we said comes into myth, but a lot of times the same archetype can have a negative or a positive side to it. So on the positive side, you know, the trickster is going to be crafty, smart, innovative, right? Intelligent, but on the negative side, you could use that intelligence in, in really what is literally a foolish way um, to be deceitful. And by the way, when I talk about foolish, that's not the opposite of having an intellect. Maybe I should explain that a different way, right? Because I just called the trickster a fool, but then I also said the primary characteristic is their intellect. What I mean is they could be very smart, but at the same time lack wisdom, Okay. Because wisdom is a virtue of the intellect, right? Where you use your intellect the right way. But not everybody does that. You can be very smart and at the same time foolish when you misuse that ability. And sometimes the tricksters do this. Okay? So that's ho hopefully clear enough. That's what I was trying to get at. All right? Now let's go and take a look at the whole idea of transformation in light of the trickster. You've got transformation both of the character himself and of society. Those are the two things that we can transform. We can transform ourselves, we can transform the world around us. Now, the self we'll look at first, right? The fool is in a unique position because they're the only ones that are able to change themselves. 
You said the fool lacks something, definitely wisdom, and can definitely grow in a particular direction. But let's just say they lack a certain degree of knowledge. I think it's the case that only somebody who knows they lack knowledge is going to be in a position to pursue the knowledge that they lack. Right? This is kind of the, the quest of Socrates, if you ever study you know, Socrates in school. He was told that he's the wisest of all individuals okay, by the, the Delphic Oracle. He hears this, and he doubts it because he knows that he doesn't know anything, or at least believes that he doesn't know anything. And he wanted to then go out and see um, if there's anybody else that's wiser than he. And, of course, as he goes around and interviews people, talks to people, and really bothers people with his constant questioning, he started to realize that, yeah, everybody lacks knowledge. Everybody is ultimately a fool. And, and long story short, he realized he's got one leg up on everybody else and that he actually understands that he's a fool, where most people are completely oblivious to that fact. Okay, But I had a martial arts instructor years and years ago um, that used to say, um, as soon as you think you know, you know something, you know, of course, within the context of martial arts, as soon as you think you know how to do something well, you stop being teachable, right? You're not able to, somebody can't come along and correct you or help you get better. Um, we kind of shut ourselves off to our growth as soon as we think we know everything. That's kind of the idea of knowledge is, is we don't have something. That's why we go and pursue it. But you have to first understand that you don't know something. So if you're not willing to be seen as a fool, then you're never going to be in a position to learn. And that's where the bravery comes in. So I want you to think about your greatest fears, okay? How many of you have heard, you know, the greatest fear? What, what, what is the greatest fear? Somebody give me some suggestions. When people are polled, very often they're going to come out and say, that, you know, spiders, all right, that's a, that's a big fear. Be fear of heights. What else? Spiders wasn't the first thing that jumped into my mind. The unknown, failure. Very good. Failure would be up at the top of that list. Uh, usually expect people to say death. Um, and some of these are related. Uh, death, it depends on how we talk about it, the unknown. Failure, um, think of us as, again, self-conscious beings. We know about ourselves. And I have a temptation to say when we know about ourselves, we also know all of our, all of our shortcomings, all of our weaknesses, all of our lack Public speaking, that's the one I figured you guys would say. Very good. Getting up in front of a group and public speaking. Of course, the old joke is since you know public speaking is our greatest fear, when you go to a funeral, you'd rather the, be the person in the coffin than the person giving the eulogy. But it's, it's true. So let me go back to that idea. Like I was saying, you are self-conscious and you're aware of your shortcomings and failings and you may see yourself as you know not um, that good at something. And you try to in our lives, this is normal, put on a particular mask or persona, put on a particular face that we show to the public. Now, I'm not saying we don't deceive ourselves because we also have this other side of ourselves that often thinks of us maybe as more capable than we actually are or more confident than we should be. But at a different level, we also have these insecurities. So when you get up in front of a crowd and you're going to do some public speaking, you're actually feeling their eyes kind of penetrating you, right? You think that they're going to see sides of you that you've been trying to keep hidden, like they're looking right through you, your soul, and you're afraid that they're going to see something about you that you don't want them to see. And I think that's in the background of our fear of public speaking, coming across as foolish, coming across as ignorant. And we try to shut down and, and avoid that. And believe it or not, even though I do this now, you know, I've been teaching for, gosh since the late 90s, um, when I was in middle school, high school, even when I got up into college and grad school, I had a absolute terror of speaking in front of people. This was one of the last things I ever thought I would be doing, is talking to groups of people for a living. My father you know, he used to make a comment, that <laughs> actually after I started teaching, he said, I don't know how you, you got into to teaching as a profession, um, partly because I'm not just afraid of it, but I'm also kind of an introvert in my regular life. So I tend to be kind of quiet, you know, in my personal life, and I don't have a lot of <clears throat> things to say in gatherings. But anyways, you can, basically the, the point is you can get past those kinds of insecurities by putting yourself into uncomfortable situations. And even though in the beginning when I taught, every semester, first class, I'd have the butterflies, I'd get sometimes even nauseous, um, I'd be shaking. 
And that happened for literally years. Um, doesn't happen so much anymore. So there's growth, right? This is that transformation that we're after, kind of the transformation of the self. Okay, so that's why bravery is required. Let's talk now about transformation of society. And that's going to involve not just being foolish, but also playing the fool. So when we impact society, there's a certain role that the trickster has in these stories to play a fool, in other words, to present themselves in a certain light in order to challenge the status quo, in order to stand against culture, right? One of the things we think of with the trickster type of motif, even today, is we think of the person um, who pushes the boundaries, right? They're going to be the class clown. They're going to be the ones that are pulling pranks. They're going to be the ones that question the rules that are set up, right? To see how far they can go. And um, that's kind of, you know, makes very apparent to other people where our cultural boundaries are actually set up. We don't often think about them consciously until we've got somebody that comes along and does something and all of a sudden everybody gets a little bit uncomfortable, right? It's kind of the idea of the comedian. They, they often are offensive. They often uh, make us uncomfortable with some of the things we say, but that's partly to challenge the culture and that's what the trickster is designed to do. They prompt awareness. They prompt change. So sometimes there are things we have in our culture that need to be changed. Okay, And there's a certain power that goes along with that. They've got an ability to do something that other people don't have to do. And that comes from the idea of playing the fool, appearing foolish. It's an advantage when you challenge the culture because if you can appear foolish, you appear kind of in a non-threatening mode, right? I like to think of the court jester, right, in the days of kings and queens as somebody that could approach the king and queen and challenge the king and queen. They could actually speak truth directly to the person in charge. But if you do it the right way, right, where the noble or, you know, other people might be able to or try to speak to the king and challenge what they say, you know, you could be risking a lot, including death. But if the fool, you know, does it in a joking manner, then they can get away with it because the king doesn't see them as a threat and they can keep them around. They can laugh at them, they can mock them, even though there's still truth coming out. And the same thing that we have today with the comedians, right? Some of the best comedians are also the people that are doing political commentary, right? They're saying things that, you know, not everybody feels safe saying because you're definitely challenging people who are in a position of power. Now, I've got a little clip here that I'm gonna play from one of my favorite shows. I don't know if any of you guys are Game of Thrones fans, but this is um, an interesting scene. I'll, I'll let it play, and then I will um, talk a little bit about it in a second. So just watch this. Hopefully the audio will be good for you. <clears throat> Sir Gontos the Red of House Holland! Here I am. Here I am. Sorry, Don't Grace. Uh, my deepest apologies. Are you drunk? No. Uh, no, no, Your Grace. Uh, I had uh, two cups of wine. Two cups? That's not much at all. Please, have another cup. You sure, Your Grace? Yes, to celebrate my name day. Have two, have as much as you like. I will be honored, Your Grace. Sir Maren, help Sir Donto celebrate my name day. See that he drinks his fill. Bad luck to kill a man on your name day. What kind of stupid peasant superstition? The girl is right. When a man serves on his name day, he reaps all year. Take him away. I'll have him killed tomorrow, the fool. He is a fool. You're so <laughs> clever to see it. He'll make a much better fool than a knight. He doesn't deserve the mercy of a quick death. Did you hear, my lady, Sir Dantes? From this day, you'll be my new fool. 
Thank you, Your Grace. Okay, you get the point, I think. Where he offends the king in the early part of the scene, in almost resulting in his death, um, because you've got really this horrible tyrant figure in Joffrey. Um, the thing that saves him is, again, being recast into a different role, right? He's recast as the fool. All of a sudden, it's not that big a deal. You could take him lightly. He's, you know, nothing truly offensive. And the interesting thing, if you, how many of you guys, you could just make a comment if you're familiar with the, with the show and what happens, but, you know, Sir Dantos ends up being in a, a key pivotal position in order to, you know, ultimately deal with this king and, and save, you know, the, the, the princess Sansa and stuff like that. Um, actually doesn't become a princess yet, but you get the point, okay? So, um, by the way, those of you that are familiar with this story, who is the real trickster? Who is the real trickster at the court at King's Landing who is really manipulating things and, and, and move, he's kind of moving the chess pieces around the board? Because Sir Dantos really is kind of a fool. He doesn't just play one. He's easily manipulated. One of the downsides of really being a fool and not merely playing the fool. Anybody know who the, the big figure is that actually is very shrewd, conniving? Maybe there's nobody in this class that knows the show. Very, very sad if that's the case. But it's very possible. Anyways, um, Littlefinger. I don't know if you guys remember him, but he's the real, you know, trickster character. So you've got, again, this archetype that shows up in all kinds of different stories and, you know, sometimes in multiple forms. So <clears throat> anyways, that's the idea and how dangerous it is. This is why it requires bravery. There's a risk involved. The risk is um, being exiled from your culture. When you challenge your culture, when you stand up to authority, you risk being exiled or you risk being marginalized. Or worse, you could be killed, as almost happened to Sir Dantos in the clip, right? And what you have in front of you is really an impossible task, the idea of challenging the order that exists. Um, now, the term impossible task, we're going to see that as another serious motif in hero stories, okay? And I'll, I'll explain what that is a little bit later when we actually see some of these impossible tasks in stories like, you know, Gilgamesh or... Heracles or etc. Okay, but this is another hero, um, heroic narrative archetype. Anyways, there's there, your failure is something that is obviously the thing that you're risking. You know, it's one thing to be marginalized and to be killed, but there are other ways to fail. It might not always be that serious, but sometimes it is. And one of the interesting things about the development that we go through in life, the person that we're trying to grow into becoming and the various tasks that we undertake in the process. Failure is more likely the case than not. You know, very often people fail to become the types of people they ought to be. Okay, especially if you're looking at a particular model um, that you're trying to emulate. There are an infinite number of ways to fail in different endeavors and a surprisingly few ways to actually succeed. It's kind of like doing math. Um, I use this analogy when we talk about logic and stuff like that in my logic or critical, critical thinking classes. But, you know, when you're doing a math problem, you know, 2 plus 2, the answer, you know the answer, right? It's 4, and it's only 4. There's no other option, even though there's a potential infinite set of numbers out there. Okay? Um, now, it's not that there are literally that many different ways um, actually possible to fail, but um, the idea is it's more likely that you're going to fail in your pursuits and succeed. Now, it's, it's a rare individual that is actually going to succeed more often than they fail, but at some point, everybody is going to meet failure, and the majority of people are going to meet failure much more than they're going to meet success. So keep that in mind as you you know make your choices throughout life, as you try to grow into the person that you want to develop into, uh, and partly being aware of that is going to Maybe make it easier to deal with than when it actually happens, right? So don't be afraid of failing. You know, it's kind of cliche advice at this point, but, you know, if you never try, then, of course, you're never going to succeed. In that case, you've already failed. So, again, the transformation tale and the trickster. All right, so that's the risk involved. Now, the trickster, in challenging the culture, stands up against the archetype of the father. And I didn't really talk about what the father represented too much in the beginning. I said we're going to talk about the father archetype, but the father archetype is the one that stands for culture 
order, and authority. The mother archetype, by contrast, usually stands for nature or, or chaos or um, something along those lines, the wild, as opposed to the father. This is an interesting thing that happens in mythological symbolism, but the father figure sometimes is the king. Now, the trickster, when he stands up against culture and order, ends up obviously being a chaos figure and can therefore emerge as somewhat of an, a villain. Okay, so let's take a look at a particular image of the trickster in modern pop culture that I think is one of the greatest examples of the trickster figure. Um, and this particular clip I'm about to show you guys um, definitely brings out that whole aspect of the trickster as a figure of chaos. If you haven't seen the movie, um, definitely worth watching. We'll be talking a lot about Batman this semester. So here's a scene from the second movie in the trilogy, The Dark Knight. You know, I don't want there to be any hard feelings between us, Harvey. When you and uh, Rachel, Rachel! Rachel were being abducted, I was sitting in Gordon's cage. Now, I, I didn't rig those charges. Your man, your plan. Do I really look like a guy with a plan? You know what I am? I'm a dog chasing cars. I wouldn't know what to do with one if I caught it. You know, I just do things. The mob has plans. The cops have plans. Gordon's got plans. You know, they're schemers. Schemers trying to control their little worlds. I'm not a schemer. I try to show the schemers how pathetic their attempts to control things really are. So, when I say... Uh, come here. When I say that you and your girlfriend was nothing personal, you'll know that I'm telling the truth. I'm gonna need schemers that put you where you are. You were a schemer, you had plans, and uh, look where that got you. What I do best, I took your little plan and I turned it on itself. Look what I did this city with a few drums of gas and a couple of bullets. Hmm? You, you know what I noticed? Nobody panics when things go according to plan. Even if the plan is horrifying. If tomorrow I tell the press that like a gangbanger will get shot, or a truckload of soldiers will be blowing up, nobody panics. Because it's all part of the plan. But when I say that one a little old mare will die. Well, then everyone loses their minds. Introduce a little anarchy. Upset the established order, and everything becomes chaos. I'm an agent of chaos. Oh, and you know the thing about chaos? Bear. Okay, I didn't ed edit that exactly the way I wanted to, but it's good enough to get the point across, right? The trickster here, of course, the Joker. I mean, the jo Joker by name, right? It's the, the the card in the deck that represents the um, the court jester, right? The trickster figure uh, is an agent of chaos, right? This whole discussion about whether he's a schemer and no, he's not a schemer. Obviously, he's a schemer. I mean, if you watch the movie, you understand that. Um, he's got some kind of complicated plan going on in the background. So there's the, the trickster intellect being used in a, in a certain way to question things, right? He's challenging the structure of society, okay? And I think Heath Ledger does probably one of the greatest jobs with this role. Um, I love Joaquin Phoenix's take on the character. If you guys have seen it, um, I recommend the movie The Joker, but I, I still prefer... The way they depict him in this movie, obviously the Joaquin. How many of you saw the Joaquin Phoenix movie Joker? Anybody? Because I think one of the 
things I didn't like about the movie, okay, good, I, I figured some of you did. The thing I didn't like about the movie was just that the Joker figure is not, um, you know, psychologically, it's a very compelling movie, but he's not this smart, um, manipulative character. He's kind of going along, going to get, get swept up in the, in the circumstances of his life, whereas, you know, the Heath Ledger role, he's, he's definitely the one kind of pulling string. He's much more of the trickster figure as an archetypal figure, okay? So let me just go on a little bit further with this whole idea of the trickster versus the father figure. Oops. I started playing again. <clears throat> like I said, the father represents culture and order, which can be both positive and negative as well, right? So the positive side of culture and order is that it protects us, right? The um, order that we have in society protects us from the chaos of nature out there. Um, human thriving somehow deter is, is dependent upon some kind of order, a uh, community, right? It's structured. But on the negative side, the father figure, the king, can become a potential tyrant, become blind, you know, willingly blind or just blind in general. That's one of the things about culture is, you know, we have these things set up way in the past, um, whether it's a constitution or certain laws, and they are made for a reason. And sometimes there's a really good design in mind and a good order that is supposed to emerge from that. But over time, people tend to forget about these things. We kind of go along with the culture, not realizing why it's the way it is. And we literally become blind to certain things. And we forget. And that can be a dangerous point, which is why people continually rise up within a society and kind of challenge and poke and prod and try to bring about change and transformation. That's a continual process throughout all human history. Okay, so the father figure sometimes needs to be challenged. Culture and order needs to be challenged. Other times it's a good thing. And whether the trickster is good or bad depends on what they're challenging, right? So the trickster, um, when they challenge the order and the order is good, they're going to come across as the villain, right? Now, they're bad, of course, when they challenge a good order. They could also be bad when they use the wrong methods. They could be bad when they make errors in their judgment. They could be bad when they have the wrong motivation. Okay, so that's why I say the trickster, depending on how they're used, depending on the story unfolds, is a precursor to the hero, but they're also a precursor to the adversary or to the villain. Now, one of the great motivators, like I said, sometimes the motivation is wrong. And one of the common motivations, as you see when we read some of these early stories, is going to be the motivation of jealousy. This is going to come into play when we read the story of Osiris, Isis, and Horus. It's going to come in when we see the story of the death of Balder, right? A very common motive that usually is going to be a bad motive. But I don't want to say it's universally bad, because jealousy is actually not always a bad thing. Here you see a little clip from The Lion King, right? This is Scar. Um, you know, basically killing his brother Mufasa. How many of you guys have seen The Lion King? It'd be a great movie to do if you're doing your, you know, your term paper on uh, movie analysis of heroes. Of course, yeah, good. Um, so again, common motivator. And jealousy, you want to think of it like this. If you never thought about what a definition of jealousy would be, uh, it's an emotion that's related to anger, but it really involves desiring something or covetousness of something in relation to a perceived rival or competitor. It's not just desiring something that you don't have, but desiring it usually at the expense of somebody else that has it, or you start to view that person as a rival that needs to be, um, you know, you need to take it from them. Now, e anger also, by the way, is not necessarily a bad thing. Anger could be good. There are times when it's actually appropriate to be angry. I don't know if anybody's ever thought of that. So there are also times when it's appropriate to be jealous, right? So there's a negative or positive. It really comes down to whether or not you have the right to something. So for instance, if somebody harmed one of my children, I would not only have the right to be angry, I would have the right possibly to um, punish that person or defend that child. And I could talk about um, jealously even guarding you know, my family and protecting my family. So we could use the term in a very positive way. It becomes destructive and problematic when we try to take something that doesn't belong to us, right? So whether it's good or bad depends literally on the rights to whatever it is that we're talking about. And it's different from a drive to emulate, right? We could see somebody else that has, you know, the car we want to drive or the house we want to live in or the career we want, or we see them being successful in um, whatever field, maybe skills on the basketball court, whatever it is. And we could be actually motivated and we might desire to want that as well. 
But as long as we don't want to strip them of it in our own pursuit of it, then that's not jealousy. Okay, that's kind of maybe the role model idea. Being uh, motivated is, is, is a good thing. Um, but when we decide, I want to take that from them, or I want that um, to the degree that if I can't have it, then I don't want them to have it either, that's when jealousy becomes an improper motivation. And that's where you have the villain manifest. Okay, So sometimes these trickster characters, in particular like Set and Loki, are going to give rise to this evil characteristic. They're going to become you know, symbols of evil and villainy. All right, that's the dangerous part of the trickster uh, motif. Now, let's just talk a little bit about tricksters in our own culture. I'm going to give you some examples uh, through, through in a, a few more video clips just to look at kind of how, for instance, the comedian functions in our society. And I'm going to apologize if some of the stuff that I'm going to show you is offensive. And again, that's probably, um, actually, I do think that really much, very, very often is exactly what comedy needs to be. But um, it's not. I'm, I'm not intending to offend you intentionally. But again, you know, just bear with me. Keep an open mind. I'm going to play uh, a couple different comedians, and I'm going to play a comedian who I'm a great fan of, talking about the idea of comedy as offensive. Okay. Again, so this is all the role of the trickster. So let's take a look at first George Carlin. Thought it would play automatically. I'm going to have to hit the play button. Here we go. Now, there's one thing you might have noticed. I don't complain about. Politicians. Oops, sorry. Everybody complains about politicians. Everybody says they suck. Yeah. Well, where do people think these politicians come from? They don't fall out of the sky. They don't pass through a membrane from another reality. They come from American parents and American families, American homes, American schools, American churches, American businesses, and American universities, and they're elected by American citizens. This is the best we can do, folks. This is what we have to offer. It's what our system produces. Garbage in, garbage out. If you have selfish, ignorant citizens, if you have selfish, ignorant citizens, you're going to get selfish, ignorant leaders. And term limits ain't going to do you any good. You're just going to wind up with a brand new bunch of selfish, ignorant Americans. So maybe, maybe, maybe it's not the politicians who suck. Maybe something else sucks around here, like the public. Okay. I don't know if you guys are familiar with George Carlin. Um, he was pretty controversial in his day. But you could tell that the whole gist of his comedy routine is geared towards challenging the culture, right? He's kind of pushing the envelope. He's, he's kind of trying to wake people up um, and bring about some type of awareness. And he does it, of course, in a humorous way. So even if you might disagree with his politics, you still can laugh at the way he presents it. Um, I think that's the mark of a, of a good comedian is even when you disagree and you could still appreciate the humor. Um, but again, the whole idea is, you know, maybe causing some type of awareness. So let's look at um, the next one, Dennis Miller. He's also a fairly political. Um, this one's not super political, but it does have to do with global warming. Let's see if this plays automatically. There we go. Global warming? Well, listen, this sounded legit to me, so I thought I'd best do some research. I don't want to piss away on this one until I know what's up. I've got kids. Now, there's a lot of differing data, but as far as I can gather, the crux of it is over the last hundred years, the temperature of this planet has gone up 1.8 degrees. A am I the only one who finds that amazingly stable? <laughs> 1.8? Are you kidding me? I could go back to my hotel room tonight and futz with a thermostat for the next three or four hours. I could not detect that difference. Yeah, I'm kind of glad it went up. I'm always a little chilly anyway. <laughs> but environmentalists, they don't want to hear it. They get really cranky. They'll give you that uh, guilt card. Well, what about your kids? Of course I love my kids. I hope they live to be 100. It's another 1.8. <laughs> and they give you, what about your kids' kids? 3.6. Uh, yeah, I'll just tell them we moved to Phoenix or something. Then they get really crazy on you. Well, what about your kids, 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 kids? You know, I'm never going to meet them. <laughs> I'd like to tell you they matter, but they don't. You get a okay. All right. Obviously a different take than Carlin, but still the same type of thing. I don't know. How many of you guys watch any of the um, late night talk show hosts? 
you know, they're generally comedians and very often they're engaged in this kind of political humor. I mean, more often than not, to tell you the truth, but anybody, I don't know, not everybody watches TV the way they used to now that we've got all the streaming services. Anybody? Anyways, let me give you one final clip and then we'll be wrapping up. But um, this next one is John Cleese. I don't know if anybody is a Monty Python fan. I love Monty Python, fell in love with it when, or them when I was in high school. So here's John Cleese actually talking about um, usually asleep late at night. That's a good good habit to be into. I unfortunately sometimes stay up way past my bedtime. Um, anyways, Cleese. Um, you know, he's been around forever. Um, British comedy, which I just adore. Um, he's talking here about this whole idea of uh, the offensive aspect of comedy. You know, how comedy is supposed to push the boundaries and, and sometimes do that to make you uncomfortable. Just listen to what he says. This is not a comedy routine, but he's, you know, talking about it in a, a very interesting way. This is fairly recent, by the way. And the whole point about humor, the whole point about comedy and believe you me, I've thought about this, is that all comedy is critical. Even if you make a very inclusive joke, like um, how do you make God laugh, answer, tell him your plans. Now, that's about the human condition. It's not excluding anyone. It's saying we all have all these plans which probably won't come, and isn't it funny how we still believe they're gonna happen. So that's a very inclusive joke, it's still critical. All humor is critical. If you start saying, oh, we mustn't, we mustn't criticize or offend them, then humor's gone. With humor, goes a sense of proportion. And then as far as I'm concerned, you're living in 1984. Oops. Okay. I kind of like what he says about humor being critical, right? When you, when you, aren't willing to go there anymore. We've kind of lost that archetype. We've lost the trickster. We've lost the ability to challenge our culture in a healthy way. It's not that you can't still challenge your culture, right? Um, all throughout history, there have been different ways to change one's culture. Sometimes it's through revolution. Sometimes it's through violence. Um, it's more effective when the change comes through peaceful means. I mean, hopefully that's what everybody prefers. Um, but that's kind of the role of the trickster here and, and the role of the comedian in, in these things. So Cleese is very uh, insightful. I noticed somebody put the comment about the life of Brian. Um, that is probably one of the two best Monty Python movies, so not to go too far off topic, but if you're interested in Monty Python comedy, the two best movies that they have, Life of Brian and Monty Python and the Holy Grail, by far. Um, life of Brian, now I don't know how many of you come from kind of a religious background, uh, let me give you kind of the setup for the film. It's basically during the time, life and times of Jesus. And you've got this figure, Brian, who's actually born in like the, the stable next door to where Jesus is being born. And he's mistaken for the Messiah. And then throughout the whole movie, um, you've got this growing band of followers. So it's kind of set in the context of, you know, first century Judaism and um, Palestine. And ultimately, you know, you end up with an interesting crucifixion scene where it's kind of a musical number, which is uh, possibly offensive to some. But it's brilliant comedy, and it is trying to prompt awareness about culture and religion, and probably more a culture than religion, as, as far as I know the, the, the Python guys kind of explain what they're trying to do with it. But the um, thing that I love about Python is these are really intelligent guys writing comedy that comes across as incredibly silly at times, but often has a real profound um, meaning behind it. So, you know, I, I can't recommend that stuff enough. You guys might not like it because it's a little bit dated. We're talking, you know, back in the you know 60s and 70s. I forget when their TV show came out, The Flying Circus. But um, if you like comedy, you need to at least give it a try. So anybody have any questions? Um, that's my introduction to Heroes. So I will take some questions after I wrap up the video. But... Um, next time we're going to move on and we're going to actually look at some trickster stories and we're going to begin with the creation story of the Numa Elish. We're going to look at Marduk and Tiamat, but we're also going to do the story of the fall of man and the book of Genesis. So we're going to be looking at the character of the serpent, who is probably the most famous of all archetypal tricksters. Okay, so until then, that's it for trickster heroes.